today, me and Mike, we decided we wanted to talk about sales. We actually wanted to do this for quite a long time, but not just to have me and Mike blab on, you know how we get. We got Darren on, Darren Goodman on here, which has been in sales with his company, Propel Sales, for over 22 years. And he just launched an exciting new project for small business owners, which is why it makes sense to make this podcast now, on how they can scale to their first million in sales. So if you think this is something that's interesting to you, definitely keep listening. And just the first question I would like to hit you with. A lot of people, they give sales a bad rep. What comes to your head when you have to define what is sales? Yeah, I think that's the perfect place to start. Um, so everybody's on the same page because there is a lot of bad rap when it comes to what selling is. My definition of sales is you have a uh, prospect or potential customer that has a need, that need needs to be filled. And so when you talk about a person that can sell ice to Eskimos, that implies that they are pulling one over on the <laughs> client. That to me is not sales. That to me is stealing. That to me is, is, uh, is possibly over negotiating, whatever the case may be. But to me, sales is finding out a prospect's pain and, and pre uh, presenting a solution that fills the need. And so when you look at it that way, it's a win-win. And that's what sales should be. Yeah, that's what makes client retention. I think that's what everybody gets wrong about sales. Like there's so much lifetime value in a client. And if you just sell out, sell the ice to the Eskimo, pull, pull one over them fast, ain't never going to see him again. You might have the money now, but you just lost them and everybody they know as a client because you, you can't be 100% sure they're going to tell everybody what you just did. So with that definition set aside, what made you start this sales journey? Just give us a little bit of the context behind where does your knowledge and expertise come from? Gotcha. Yeah, I've done in my 35 year career, I've done just about everything you can do in sales. I started in a phone room selling telemarketing, um, selling printer ribbons back in the late 80s. <laughs> I don't it's even know what back. that is. I don't know what a printer <laughs> ribbon is. And, and you may not recall the late 80s either, but that's where it all started. Um, and that's where I, I learned um, in that phone room, I learned how to communicate in sales. And that became the guiding light for everything I did in sales going forward. It was a, a, the ability to uncover a pain and to fill, uh, fill a need. From there, I went into sales management. I got into uh, outside sales or person-to-person or -person sales. Um, I did uh, sales training. I did sales hiring and firing. Uh, executive uh, at executive level, uh, and then a corporate speaker as well. So I've done just about everything you can do in the sales arena, all starting with how do you communicate at a professional level with a prospect that has a need and a pain. Hmm. And that's really what, what sales comes, comes down to. Communication is a big part of it. And to the people that's watching, been watching us, what I normally say sales is about is like ability and trust. And I mentioned this to Darren on our first call, and I know he has a different take on it. So why don't you give us you, what is your take us? What is sales made off of from the foundation? Yeah. So tell me the two words that you use as well, because I don't know that it's different, but it might be a little wider. Yeah. What were your two words? Well, for me, it's like ability and trust. Nobody buys. Well, like from, That's yeah. Right. Okay. So, I agree with both of those things. Um, Likeability is extremely important, uh, but how far do you go with your rep rapport building in that first meeting? That is something I always train on because I've seen salespeople spend a lot of time becoming likable and then losing all that time on the end when you really had to prove value and then um, prove that you were the, the, the right solution to their need. So when I train sales, when we start with rapport building, I keep it rather light because my feeling is if the prospect needed a friend, there are websites to go to find friends <laughs> and to find dates and all of those things. They're looking for value. So if you focus on value out of the gates, 
then I believe that's a better place to start. And from that, trust will be built. Because I do agree with, of your two things, likability and trust, I agree with both of them, but trust is tantamount. It is absolutely the most it, paramount. It's the most important piece of the puzzle. And so to do that, you have to prove value. So it starts with me with how well do you collaborate? And by collaborating with the prospect, you have an opportunity to work together on solutions that are win-win. If you start off by proving your value or proving how you're different, then you're going to, the prospect is going to push back a little bit because they really need help understanding what's available in the early stages of the sale. Once you have an understanding together what their needs, what their pain is, and they understand what their options are, then you can move to proving your value, proving your differentiation, offering your solution options, and then closing the sale as well. That all comes together a lot smoother if you start with helping them understand what their pains are and what options are available to them. How do you go about getting a prospect to open up to you? And some people in conversation will reveal their pain at some level, and then we always want to go deeper and figure out what's really hurting in business. But how do you go about doing that or teaching people how to do that? I believe that question taps into the most important part of the sale, and that's how well you uncover pain by asking questions. There is nothing more important in the sales process than how well you uncover pain by asking questions. So how do we go about that? It's that secondary and tertiary question that works best. So you ask a question such as, you know, what issue did you have? And they say it's X, Y, Z. The secondary question is, so how does that issue affect your life or how does it affect your business? And then they answer that question. And sometimes they're realizing for the very first time just how their problems are affecting their life because you asked. And then you can ask a couple more to drill down to make sure there's a real understanding. But the key to that, Mike, is at no point when you're asking questions, do you sell your service or your product? So if they say, oh, I've had a problem uh, working with vendors like yourself because of X, Y, Z. And then you say, oh, boy, do I understand that issue? That's why we don't do this, that or the other. And we only do these three things. The point being is stick to asking, asking questions and asking questions only until there's a complete understanding as to the prospect's pain and for them to understand the options that are available to them. Well, that's really interesting, Darren. So the idea is that we keep asking questions instead of offering information. We keep asking until we figure we're pretty close to their deep pain, right? Correct. Wow. Yeah, I think I've been making a mistake on that because sometimes I share information before I'm at the deep pain. So I think I've just that's, learned something here. That's the biggest problem in sales. Because if we understand there's two stages that a prospect goes through. The first stage is understanding the options that are available. And the second stage is, okay, why you? Most salespeople don't understand that first stage exists. And in that first stage, the prospect does not want to know about you. You come across as self-serving when you start selling yourself too soon. But once you've collaborated with them and they understand the options that are available to them, at that point, they want to know. They have to know why you. And that's when you sell yourself. But at that point, they're open to it. Prior to that, it just feels self-serving to them. And a lot of salespeople lose the sale at that first stage because they don't realize the first stage exists. Wow, that's really fascinating. I hope everybody out there is taking notes on this. Moss looks like he got a question. We are online. We're delivering your service online. Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that we nail the why you process? Part of the process. Oh. It, an effective sales process begins with understanding two really important things. Number one, what does your target audience in general need? What are their pains? And two, how do you fill that need? And how do you do that differently than the competition? 
Now, it's not necessarily how you do it differently. It's how do you communicate your differentiation from your competition? That strategy, that's actually marketing strategy. That's where an effective sales process begins. So if you're looking at about, you're looking at companies that do online sales, that's number one. Who is your audience? Define your audience first because you can't be everything to everyone. So once you define your audience, then you figure out, okay, how do I serve that audience and how do I communicate that in a way that's different than, than my competition? And so it's really important that that's where it starts. Now, when you say online sale, are you talking about e-commerce or are you talking about there is a face-to-face -face sales process happening at some point? Well, I was actually, I was referring to online service. Somebody that's sure. uh, yeah, delivering a service online. I know you're partly Good. doing that yourself. Absolutely. I, it, our community is all online. Mm. 100% online. So actually, that might be a better example. How do you go about and making sure that your community is different than all the other sales communities out there? Because if, if we go looking, I'm pretty sure we can mm -hmm. accumulate a, a pretty big list. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, so let's explain what our community is. And I'm going to start by drinking our own Kool-Aid here and saying, all right, we know who our audience is. Our audience are typically business to business service companies, although some of them are business to consumer as well. But the, the defining factor between the two is they do a face to face sale. They are companies that are looking to reach their first one million in sales or they have reached 1 million by sheer hard work and then they plateaued and now they need a strategy to get to million number two to their second million. So our audience are um, startups and early stage businesses looking to get to their first one to $2 million in revenue. Our community starts with our free services. And when I say free services, the free services are not a big commercial to grab them to pay us something. They're truly free. And I liken it to when I started HubSpot or Canva or Zoom. All three of those, I started with free services. And when I needed to upgrade without being hounded by anybody, I decided to upgrade. And now I pay for all of those, th those three services. That's exactly how our community works. So to answer your question, Moss, it all begins by offering free services that gets them to engage, that offers them value that they can use to build their business. And we're focused on one thing, a go-to-market selling strategy. So how is our community, community different? We are the only community that is built that will create a go-to-market selling strategy for our members at a startup pricing. I'm not saying we're the only go-to-market um, go to market strategy company. I'm saying we're the only ones that will do that at a uh, startup pricing where, where the, they can get what they need at a price they can truly afford. Because our other company, our parent company, that's a $5,000 a month retainer where we work one on one with businesses between five and 50 million in revenue. That five million, I mean, sorry, that $5,000 <laughs> a month. It's a great price for what they get, but there's no startup that should pay that kind of money. Even if they could afford it, they shouldn't. No, so they have, to, they have to figure it out on their own. And we help them from having to figure it out on their own by doing it at small business pricing. Then you also, first of all, most startups won't hurt that and their cash flow would absolutely go to shit if they did that. And partly you might also hurt a person by giving them too much of a head start, of course, it's always good to hire people to do something for you. But it's always good to have like a base knowledge before you go out and hire somebody because you can get lucky and hire Darren on the first go for sure. But you might also not hire Darren and hire a guy that doesn't know what he's doing and he's going to run a quick one on you. So having just like the base information to ask the right questions is crucial, I would say. It looks like somebody, yep. something is ticking in Mike's set. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I've always got questions. <laughs> oh, this is really fascinating, Darren. I like the idea of having the uh, community with the free things. We do that as well. We're in a different space than you are. It's so crucial in sales for people to be able to experience 
who the other salespeople are, who are the professionals, and, and learn and see what's going on before they go forking out a lot of money. It's super encouraging. But that's not all you do to help the world. You're also part of Extraordinary Lives Foundation, aren't you? Oh, wow. You dug deep. <laughs> yeah, that, that is my nonprofit time. Yeah, I love to promote Extraordinary Lives Foundation. If you, Yeah, if you know that, absolutely. Well, yes. tell us about that. It's it's really great when we run into other entrepreneurs who are really using their skills to help people. Yeah. It's, it's something very close to our heart. So, yeah, tell us what that's all about. Well, it's funny because, I yeah, I, I'm, I'm in the marketing side of, uh, of that organization. So that organization focuses on mental health awareness, uh, awareness prevention and the like for children. So we focus on the zero to eight and their, their caregivers, their parents and their, their grandparents and things of that nature. And so the reason I got involved in that, well, the reason I got involved initially was because uh, I had a very good friend whose son took his life uh, right after high school um, that, that tied to mental health issues that none of us knew existed. And then my wife dealt with depression um, and I learned a lot about it from that as well. And so um, from there, I, I got into the mental health world and there is a huge, huge stigma with mental health, as we all know. And so my feeling is by working with ELF, which is the Extraordinary Lives Foundation, by working with them, I believe we are molding our next generation to ensure there is no stigma around mental health. And so we have a great mascot named Piggy Bear. That's half pig, half bear. You go ahead and figure out which half is which. <laughs> goes into these elementary schools and teaches kids about their uh, social emotional issues, uh, how to use deep breathing and uh, other tactics to understand your own emotions and understand that when you have emotions, you're not alone. Every single person does. And it's quite all right if your emotions spin you in a bad direction, we'll, we'll show you how to get out of it type thing. So that's what Extraordinary Lives Foundation is all about. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, it's super incredible. Encouraging when I was reading about this foundation, and I, I love the acronym. You guys are a bunch of elves. Yeah, that's hilarious. Yeah, of a sort. <laughs> so uh, when you're in a sales conversation, does being part of that foundation then help you figure out if somebody might be struggling, but they just don't they don't want to say it? I don't really use it in business almost at all. I, I don't find it does. It, 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 I don't find that there's a correlation between what I do um, in my professional life versus that giving back I do on the personal side. Um, there are connections that work, but yeah, I, I, in a sales process, there's there's very little talk of mental uh, mental health or mental uh, uh, or mental illness in any way. Yeah, I just wondered about that. I've I've sure. always the kind of sales I've done have been very technical, so it's it's much more about the features and the attributes and the undocumented features, software bugs. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a different type of person than, than you talk to. Yeah, uh, no, it, it, yeah, it's a different, it's a whole different arena uh, for sure. When it comes to sales, uh, for me, it's all about higher level communication. Um, now there is uh, a sales tenacity. There is a sales drive. There is a sales get it done. All of that stuff to me, everybody's a little bit different and they all do it slightly different way. The sales strategy that I teach is the icing on the cake. You, uh, if you have the cake, I will promise you, I mean, there's a, you know, the, the Stephen Covey sharpen your saw, you, you're probably familiar with that, um, mm. that uh, one of the seven, uh, seven effective, highly uh, effective habits of highly effective people, not well delivered, sorry, mm. but um, sharpen, sharpening the saw is what I believe every salesperson must do on a very regular basis in order to stay at the top of their game. And that's what sales strategy is for me, is that it is, it is you, everything I do is systemized. And the reason for that is the shortest distance between two points, we all know is a straight line. The system is the straight line. It gets you from A to Z faster and more efficiently if you follow a system. And that's what the strategy is all about. And I do this in seven steps. So there are seven different things that we teach throughout our community in our sales trainings that we do within our community. 
Um, there are seven different things. And if you understand all of these, I promise you every single day you study any of the seven, you'll have a different aha moment because it's so deep. There's so many ways you can go, that type of thing. So what would you say? We, we can also use the seven steps. I don't know if you want to share them here. But what makes up a good sales process if somebody is sitting there are sitting up there and well, nearly hitting the head into the desk like that's mm -hmm. that's the point i've nearly gotten to i've only gotten to the hand in real life but the head's nearly been there like what is what can that person do to go out and make sales fun again yeah um how to make sales fun again that that last sentence actually changed what i was thinking about for the first half <laughs> well it kind of changed the question well you know, sales is like sports. You go out there, you work hard, and, and if you win, it's fun. And if you don't win, it's not fun. But, you know, not winning is part of the challenge, and which makes it part of the fun. But certainly to make it fun again is, is you are making relationships. People value you and your time. People value what you have to offer, and you're making sales and making money. Those are all the things that go into to, to having fun in sales in my mind. How to make that work to your advantage best is that you do have a system where you understand the sales process right after rapport building, because rapport building is always a piece of the puzzle, but right after rapport building, do you know how to pre-qualify? Because if you don't know how to pre-qualify, there's a really good chance you're going to waste your time and worse your prospects time. And so we all know that if a hundred people come into the top of your funnel, it might only be 10 people that come out at the bottom as a client. And so if you're pre-qualifying, you're understanding early on, hey, do we even have a fit? Let's find out right at the beginning. Once we pre-qualified, then we go straight into uncovering there. And, and by the way, doing a poor job of pre-qualifying is the number is, is the first mistake that rookie salespeople make. Is they take people down the road that should never go down the road. It's a waste of everybody's time. The second piece is how well do you uncover that pain? And are you focusing on pain? Are you fact finding? Well, fact finding is not a part of sales. That's customer service. That's order taking. Sales is uncovering a pain, an emotional pain. Then the next thing that's missed most is how well do you collaborate? And Mike, this is what we were talking about a few moments ago where you said, oh, I might miss that collaboration part. That's where you're helping them understand what's available as a trusted advisor, not a sales guy, as a trusted advisor. And then once you've collaborated, how well do you prove your value and your differentiation? That's the next step. And then it goes down the road. So to answer your question, the best way to have fun in sales is to have a system and we call our system the seven best practices of selling because that's exactly what they are. They are the best practices that systemize the way you do your sale and it ends up being a whole lot more fun for everybody involved. Do you have like a nice simple sheet for everybody that they can fact check their process of these seven steps? So we have it documented for sure, um, but it's got to be personalized because mm. Everybody has a different, different differentiation. Everybody has a different value. Everybody has a different service. So we take the same seven steps, but we personalize it to each individual sale. And here's the key to this. There are companies that do sales training and I've done a lot of sales training and it is of extreme value. I don't focus on sales training for sales people. And here's the reason why I focus on helping a business owner create a selling system. What's the difference? If you send your three salespeople off to sales training, and there's some great ones out there. Sandler is one that's been around forever and a day. And there's others out there. Back when I started, there was Zig Ziglar. Mike, you might remember that name. Oh, right? yeah. 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 Well, that's an that's a oldie. <laughs> that brings back, yeah, that goes way back. So back in the late 80s, I, I went to go see Zig live in Dallas, you know, for three in a three-day thing, and, and it was fun. So, But the point is, if, if as a business owner, you send somebody to a sales training, the problem is this. When that salesperson leaves, they take your investment right with them. But if you take mm -hmm. time to build your own personalized selling system, then you own your growth. 
You own your, you can scale your business. You can have predictable, sustainable sales if you have people that follow your system, as opposed to having to go find a rainmaker or teach somebody how to do communication skills that, as I mentioned, they take along with them. And that's the difference in what we do. We focus on the business owner building a systemized selling plan for their business and then showing them how to plug the people in and train the people on their plan. That really is different. Good. My, <laughs> our, our main our main business here is analyzing companies and figuring out which ones to invest in. And this is a piece that I always look at. What's the quality of sales? What's the quality of future sales? Where's future sales going to come from? Yep. And uh, I don't think I've seen it or heard anybody other than, uh, you know, the very famous Mr. Musk does this. But I have not heard anybody else say what you just said about how the business owner themselves needs to be in charge of that sales process as far as understanding it and training people and helping people understand it instead of just hiring in, as you say, rainmakers. Uh, because this is always a risk in investing. If a company's hiring a bunch of rainmakers, as you say, what happens when they leave? Or right. get poached. Right. Or what if it's what if it's the owner that's doing all the sales? As an investor, that's a red flag because if the owner's selling, they're selling. It's a lot. huge red flag. Yeah, it's, it, yeah. That means they don't have a, a sellable business. They, they didn't create a business. They created a job for themselves. And well, so this is what this yeah, came yeah. up. This came up because you asked how we're different, and this is how we're different. We focus on the business owner building a selling system. So somebody like you, Mike, that's looking to invest or to purchase or to acquire, you're saying, oh, I'm buying a machine that has components that all work together to pump out a result that is that is predictable. You what a concept, <laughs> predictable yeah. results, gee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, do you, you have any, um, we'll have links down below the episode. for Mike, before you end it, I have one group. question I got to ask. How was it? He's got a question. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I want to ask this question. Um, last time in Denver, I saw Nicole, I spoke about, I actually wanted the parts of the process I enjoy most is prospecting. But that also made me want to ask the question, what is some good ways of doing prospecting in 2024? Okay. So here's how we teach it. We teach there's two pieces to that puzzle. Piece number one is how you brand yourself to your target audience that is not yet actively buying. So an example of that would be, let's say you lease a car and you've got eight months left on your lease, eight payments left. You are probably not actively looking for you. You might be inactively looking like, let's see what drives down the street. What might I like? I haven't bought a new car in three years, but you're not actively looking. What we focus on there is your branding strategy. How are you communicating in a way of education? How are you educating your audience? Because at that stage, they hear your ads, they see your ads, but it's all subconscious because they're not actively looking yet. And so you want to get messages out that educate your audience on what they need to be looking for when the time comes that they are ready to engage. And that's hitting their subconscious mind with those messages. Now, let's say that same person is now four to five weeks away from turning in their car and needing a new car. Now they're actively looking because they only have one or maybe two payments left. So they're actively looking. Now they haven't purchased a car in three years. They don't know what features are available. They don't know what technology is available. And what else has happened in the last year? Well, interest rates have gone sky high. So now financing is different. So now you are focused on your lead generation strategy, which is a call to action backed by an urgency. That's very important because now what you need to do is you need to entice that audience who is now actively looking to engage with your sales team. So the answer is you start off with your branding strategy based on education, and then you have a separate campaign that is based on a call to action with an urgency. And that's what we create for our clients 
so they understand because this might sound great conceptually, but now put pencil to paper and do it. <laughs> that's, that's the hard bit. Hard. Yeah, that's the hard and bit. That's, well, that's the one thing about the way our, our, our program and our community works is not all, none of it's DYI. You don't do it yourself. We don't hand you, uh, you know, worksheets and say, work it out because nothing will happen. We actually guide you through the process with a high level selling strategist that works with these five to $50 million companies, but we do it in a group setting. And that way, kind of like the internet works, everybody pays less because we have an opportunity to speak to maybe 10 people at a time or five people at a time, which means everybody's price is lower. That's how we get to do this at a low, low business um, uh, startup cost. Aside from all the free stuff we do. But that, I'll definitely, I have the luxury if I added this. So I may actually listen to it all, all there afterwards. I can take all of the notes there. It's always great to. I'm already taking notes. I'm ahead of you, man. <laughs> well, yeah, as you've been to a, you've been to a few of our round tables, our free round, our Friday round tables, right? I, I, you've been to at least one, if not two. Yeah, I've been to one. I didn't quite make it to the last one because they sell out quite fast. Yeah. Yeah, we do. <laughs> that was a bit too well, slow. Yeah, we, we found out that if you have more than 30 people, it really bogs down the conversation. So we really try to keep it between 22 and, and 30. You never know exactly who's going to show up. So, yeah, so we tend to fill up, uh, even though they're free, it's called <laughs> Eventbrite calls it sold out. But it, we fill up typically by Thursday afternoon. Um, but, yeah, th those are, are where it all starts. That's, that's where you can really gain an understanding as to how these concepts can fit. And then you're talking with other business owners trying to figure out how to make this work for themselves. Yeah, this is going out on a Tuesday. So there's modes like just still space if you're watching this on release. So we're going to make sure yeah. to have the link down to the relevant one. It's going to be a few weeks ahead of time. But so sure. we're going to have the, the right link to the right one. I'm going to message Darren as soon as this goes, a little bit before this goes up. So we're going to have the right link down there. And as Excellent. Mike kind of in, like contradicted to a little bit before I rudely interrupted him, we're also <laughs> going to make sure to have other, the other links down below. So what is the best platforms to get a hold of you or learn more about the community and what you do? Yeah, so going directly to me on LinkedIn is the best way to go. Um, I, I also can leave you with my email as well. Um, but uh, we do a lot of what we do, we do primarily through LinkedIn. So we're going to have those links down below. Well, thank you very Excellent. much for, for coming on. So me and Mike could actually stay on subject. I think that's the main reason why <laughs> we have guests on here. Because if we don't, then we're in La La Land in about five minutes. Well, buddy. I'm sure you've never seen this as a professional sales guy, but we are we are two people in the same company, and between the two of us, there's still not a complete brain. <laughs> a complete what? Brain. Oh, that's not true. That's not true at all. I get the feeling. I, I get the feeling there's plenty of brain power on this uh, in this call. Five years ago, my business partner asked me, "If we're so dang smart, how come we're not helping more people?" And I said, "Well, the problem is." We're helping people all over the world with various sorts of charity work, but we're not training businesses how to do better. So five years ago, we started this branch of company to help business, specifically help businesses do better, and make more money. So then you can go out and do more good in the world. That's the reason you want to book this call to find out if what we know and what your business needs intersect and maybe we can help you. Book the call. Let's talk. It's 30 minutes. Let's find out.